Hello there. ASMR, <laughs> ASMR. I, I digress. This is, it's the music stupid. What number is this? I don't know. I don't care because it's about the music. You already know. You've seen it below. So five records from my collection. I just want to give a little shout outs about mixing genres, mixing musical styles, and just showing records, music, 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 which is the primary part of this enjoyment, I think, in uh, this world of vinyl collecting. We like the vinyl, we like the records, we like the covers, but ultimately we like the music. And I say this every time <laughs> in a different way. It's the same thing, so you know it. If you're new here, thank you, welcome, subscribe, do all the wonderful things. Uh, say something in the comments, good, bad, ugly. Just don't be mean-spirited, okay? So, Britpop. The early 90s Britpop thing. I'm going to show this debut album by Suede. Now, uh, the Britpop scene, in a way, was a result of the, of what was happening with... Uh, I mean, obviously, there was post-punk and there was um, grunge uh, on the West Coast, obviously, in Seattle and the great Pacific Northwest. As tree huggers wearing their... Um, I wasn't one of them at the time. At least I was a California Bay Area tree hugger. But um, now that I'm a... Uh, Pacific Northwest resident, I can wear plaid and I can get into the official costume. But as much and as popular as that was, I wasn't all in. I'm not a big fan of that. Is that yarling? What's that vocal style called? But Britpop took psychedelic music, took a little bit of the grunge stuff and made it very accessible, very commercial. Uh, and I like British music to begin with. So, you know, went back to uh, Beatleish times, kinkish times, and brought the 60s and made it something somewhat new and revitalized it in uh, the early 1990s. Now, of course, I think there were four of the, the king Britpop makers. There was Pulp, there was Suede, and the two big two, the big two, were Blur and Oasis. Uh, I did see Oasis on a small club tour in San Francisco at a small club called the Bottom of the Hill Club their first time around. And of course they exploded. But none of these Britpop groups were really that big in the US. Maybe Oasis with Wonderwall, but they just didn't really cross over here. But um, I never had this record. I knew the record very well and I got it in the Coleman collection. This is an original UK copy of Suede. I had heard it, but I didn't really know it well. Um, and Suede and Pulp weren't the big sellers uh, in the same way as Oasis and Blur. In fact, isn't there that infamous time when Blur and Oasis released uh, albums the exact same day? And I think all the press, it was like it was like the old Beatles Stones uh, revitalization of the, you know, which one's better? Are you a Beatles Stones fan? Are you Oasis or a Blur fan? Um I think Drowners was the first single on this. This is really good. It's got some psychedelic. It's got some, obviously, uh, very uh, accessible commercial, but really well done. And I believe after this, uh, they were imploding a little bit. I think one of the members left. Uh, you know, typical band uh, bullshit of them. Uh, arguing, don't know what they want. They went up and down. They had some great hits later. I really did not follow them. So I'm a novice with suede, so if anyone knows if I should get into any other suede, they they disbanded, they reformed, they disbanded, they reformed. I don't even know who's in the friggin' band anymore, but um, I love this record. And again, it was so great to get a, a vinyl copy, and especially the first the first uh, pressing, the UK pressing. So on nude records, a lot of these bands were on independent labels in the UK. Eventually, they got gobbled up. Now. The Love and Spoonful, Do You Believe in Magic? Ironically, the irony is they had huge singles. 1965, 66, 67, huge singles. One of the best summer singles ever still is 1966, uh, Summer of the City, which is not on this record. But I think this is the sweet spot. And in a way, album-wise, they were really ahead of their time because... Not only did they have great, sweet, popular singles, they had a little country, little uh, um, rootsy flavor to the music, jug band music, in essence, of course, that great um, 
lead singing for the most part of John Sebastian and the auto harp. You'd see him on these TV shows in the mid 60s playing the auto harp. I never saw that before, I don't think. We used to play those in school, the little auto harp thing. It was so great. I think this is the sweet spot of their albums. Uh, and it does round off with some co sort of organic jug band music like uh, Night Out Blues, Fish and Blues. That's bottle in the uh, blues in the bottle. That isn't the kind of stuff we were listening to as kids in 1965, 66. But this had three songs that were great songs, great singles in uh, the title uh, track, Do You Believe in Magic? What a great song. Very, I mean, just great pop singles. And this is a, a Mono Sundays reissue, which I highly recommend. Uh, this is actually cut by Kevin Gray. Now, I know it's the music, but you might as well get a good sounding record if you can, because a lot of these old records were well played and chewed up and not taken care of. Uh, but the mono copy here uh, by Kevin Gray cut on Sundays, all analog, is really good. And of course, the other songs, uh, did you ever have to make up your mind? Just the guitar sound that they got. And uh, these were produced by Eric Jacobson, who would later go on to produce uh, well, Sop with Campbell, uh, Hello, Hello, and uh, The Mir Miraculous Return of the Hump, Sop with Campbell. He, in the uh, back, way in the 80s and, and for first five albums or so, he produced Chris Isaac, and he, he's a great producer. I don't know what much else about him, but he produced all these great uh, hits by Love and Spoonful. And of course, Younger Girl is such an amazing song on here. Those are the three key songs that seem more original. The others... Not that they're not original, but they're more of that jug band mode. That Those three songs really capture the essence of Love and Spoonful. I don't see a lot of love around here, but they should be, I think, uh, reevaluated. Uh, all their albums are good. They didn't make many. Was it four main albums, I believe? Five, maybe. There's a soundtrack there. Uh, also, um, and they're used in uh, <laughs> the Woody Allen uh, What's Up Tiger Lily, too, on that soundtrack. But... Um, Good time music. That's exactly what that other music is. They're a good time music band, very traditional in some es essence, and a response to the British invasion and others. And a uh, true American band, a wonderful band, Love and Spoonful. Now, going into organics again, this, and I just coincidentally, this is another Sunday's reissue that's cut by Kevin Gray, just to let you know. And this only, uh, is in mono as well. And this is My Brother Sings, Chet Atkins, and his brother Jim. And what's interesting about this, recorded in 1959 in Nashville, at RCA Studios, I believe, this is an amazing sounding record. And this never came out in the day. This, I don't believe, came out until Sundays issued it. Maybe there were pressings or copies coming around, but for whatever reason, it was shelved back in the day. It's it and the brother sings. It's country, organic, some traditional songs like Swanee River, uh, Slinky and Apple Blossom Time, My Funny Valentine. Really good record. Don't let this kind of quirky, nerdy cover fool you. This is damn friggin' great sounding record. So, uh, Living Stereo, obviously RCA, so well recorded in Nashville. One of the greatest guitar players of all time, Chet Atkins. And, of course, you know, the country gentleman, the Gretsch Guitars, I mean, named after this guy. I mean, God, there he is, Chet. Great, great, great A&R at RCA Records in Nashville. Fantastic. You can find this cheap still, I think. Now we're going to go... Uh, an, a British band that I really like, and it's it's kind of a project, and it's um, the project recorded by uh, Carl Wallinger, and this is World Party. I think a lot of you do know uh, World Party. If you don't, you need to. Any record of theirs is great. Carl Wallinger was one of the original members of the Waterboys, um, and then he left, they split up, and he started doing his thing under the name, under the moniker World Party. What's this record in particular, Goodbye Jumbo. Uh, these have been reissued in the last several years on vinyl. I think there's another one of their albums coming out imminently on vinyl. Great reissue project, and they sound good, because remember, these came out during the um, uh, the uh, CD revolution, CD era. And if you don't know their music, you should listen. Uh, he, in a way... He's one of the, those uh, artists that really are heavily influenced by 60s music and early 70s, insofar as 
Every song sounds like someone else, but he does it in his own way. His songs sound like the Beatles. His, song, his, his songs sound like Prince. His songs sound like the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, the arrangements, and they're very catchy. I've seen him live three times in clubs. I think last time was about a decade ago in San Francisco, the Great American Music Hall. He came around there twice and was fantastic. Great band, great singer, great arranger, uh, great composer, but he takes songs of Bob Dylan and, and the Stones and, and, and he twists them around. So every time you hear his music, you think, haven't I heard that before? There's a little hip hop occasionally on some of his records, but that's just a, a you know, bring it into the uh, modern era, but not so much. And that's not a bad thing. He he brings it up and, you know, he's just very influenced. I mean, rip off, some would say rip off, but he doesn't rip them off. He takes them, twists them around and put them, puts it out there. Not as exact like the Ruddles did with the Beatles, because that's a little too close for comfort. But he does it in a beautiful way. I would say uh, Goodbye Jumbo might be the uh, starting point, but any of their records are really good. But um, highly recommended. World Party. There you go. And lastly, a record that to some folks of a certain generation needs no introduction, but... It's the crazy world of Arthur Brown, which was the name of the band, led by, of course, Arthur Brown. The de debut album, 1968, on track records. Uh, that was the Who's Kit Lambert's label. Kit Lambert, who was the Who's producer. This was produced by Kit Lambert. And this, I think, was the single fire. It hit the top of the charts in many countries. I think it hit number two in the U.S., but it was all over. And, of course, the single is that single edit that starts with I Am The God Of Hellfire and I Bring You that explosive sound of fire. Every song on side one is a sweet. Opening up with Prelude, Nightmare, Fanfare, Fire Poem, and of course this song, Fire. It's it's out there, It's he screams it like a wild banshee vocal style, a little prog-like in a way. There's so much psychedelia intenseness going on. Theatrically, I never got to see him, unfortunately, and he's still alive. But um, then he did he did a, a series of albums under the name Kingdom Come uh, later in the 70s, I believe. But this record, what a fantastic psychedelic cover. This is my original copy. It still sounds great. I do have a reissue, but come on. I mean, I put this on. This is the copy I put on. And this is a stereo. I believe, obviously, this is 1968. So there was a mono version, but I think I only have the, um, the stereo. Now, yeah, 1968 Atlantic track distributed by Atlantic Records. What a friggin' record. It's funny. I re I played side one of this record so much. I don't even remember what side two sounds like. I played it recently in the car and side two wasn't very familiar. And I've had this record, what, 54 years or something. And I, side two is just such a dramatic piece of music making, of record making. It just bowls me over. This is a fantastic record. This is a record that you... It's not a record to put on in the background as far as I'm concerned. You blast this in a car, okay, on a CD or on a, on a stream, whatever you're doing, or you put this on. The record obviously sounds better than any digital version, but this is great. The Crazy World of Arthur Brown track records. And that is not quite speed dating with Mazzy today, but that is, it's the music stupid number, what it is. Subscribe, do all the good things. Fire. God, so great. That's a, I'm going to go put that on right now. You know, I, I'm going to blast it as loud as I can. Mazzy loves you.